All right, one of the biggest questions I get asked is, do you need a lens filter and which one should you buy? Now, the three main types of filters that you'll see are UV filters, ND filters, and PL filters, each serving different purposes that we'll go over in this video to help you know which one you should buy for what purposes. There are other specialty filters out there, but most people will only ever use one of these three. So first, let's talk about a UV filter. UV stands for ultraviolet because they block ultraviolet sun rays from hitting your lens and camera sensor. Now, this this matters for film cameras, but for digital cameras, the UV rays really aren't that big of a deal. So all a UV filter really does is protect the lens from getting scratched or damaged. But the trade-off of using a UV filter is that if you buy a cheap filter, it gives you some unwanted extra flaring elements when pointing at light. So I personally never use UV filters unless I'm shooting something super messy like a mud fight or paint wars event where I want to really protect my lens. Moving on to our second type of filter is an ND filter, which stands for neutral density. Basically, the only function of an ND filter is to to reduce the amount of light coming into the camera. Why would you want to do this? Well, as we talk about in other videos, one of the basic rules of shooting video is to set your shutter speed at twice your frame rate. So if you're shooting at 24 frames, you'll want to set your shutter speed at 1 50th, giving your footage a natural looking motion blur. Shooting at twice the frame rate will give your footage the amount of motion blur that our eyes are used to seeing in real life. Just wave your hand in front of your face right now and you'll notice that it looks blurry and not choppy. So to replicate that amount of motion blur, you should always set your shutter speed to double your frame rate. The problem is, if you also want a shallow depth of field or background blur, then you'll have to set your aperture low, like around 2.8. And if it's a bright sunny day, having your shutter speed and your aperture set low lets in too much light into your camera, overexposing your image. So in order to have both a low shutter speed and a low aperture, you have to use an ND filter to cut down the amount of light entering into your camera sensor. So that's the main reason to use ND filters is to cut down the light so you can keep your motion blur and your background blur. So which ND filter should you buy? There are basically two types of ND filters, fixed NDs and variable NDs. Fixed NDs are set at a certain amount of light they cut out, and you'll usually see numbers next to it like ND8, ND16, ND64. Basically, the higher the number, the more light it cuts out. So depending on how bright it is outside, it will depend on which one of these you'd want to use. For example, if it's a bright sunny day outside, here are the different camera settings you'd need to use with each of these filters. If you don't have a filter and wanted to shoot at 2.8 aperture, you'd have to crank up your shutter speed to one two thousandth of a second, which would get rid of your motion blur and make your image look too choppy. But if you use an ND8, that would allow you to bring your shutter speed down to one four hundredth, which is still too high. And then if you use an ND16, that would allow you to bring your shutter speed down to one one sixtieth, which is close to where you want to be when shooting at 60 frames per second, but still too high if you're shooting at 24 frames per second. And if you put on an ND64, that would allow you to bring your shutter speed down to one fiftieth. So for bright sunny days shooting at 2.8 aperture, the ND64 is going to be the right filter to use if you want to get a 1 50th shutter speed. The ND16 is going to be the best for shooting slow motion, and the ND8 is going to be most ideal to use when it's cloudy. As you can see in this shot, when it's cloudy shooting at 2.8, the ND8 gives you a correct exposure at 1 50th of a shutter speed. So depending on the lighting situation will depend on which one is best to use. If I could only buy one of these NDs, I'd probably choose the ND16, as it's in the middle of the three, so it will probably be the most useful in most scenarios. And that's probably the biggest con of shooting with fixed NDs, is you'd have to constantly change them out every time the lighting changes, which is why many prefer to use variable NDs that allow you to twist the filter to let in more or less light, depending on if there's clouds or if it's sunny or whatever. So this is a much more convenient and more practical way to use NDs. However, the biggest con to variable NDs is that they tend to give you a little bit of vignetting or darkening around the edges of your image, or it can also cause an X if you use cheaper variable NDs. So I recommend paying good money to get a nice ND so it doesn't cheapen your image. And the brand I use and recommend is Polar Pro. They make super high quality filters for DSLR lenses, drones, GoPros, Osmos, phones, just about every kind of camera you can think of. And I've used other brands in the past that have worked fine, but Polar Pro has been my favorite so far. And they actually just came out with two new variable NDs that are actually the best high quality variable NDs that I've ever used. They have one that covers a range of two to five stops and one that covers a range of six to nine stops. And people keep asking me which of those two they should buy if they can only afford one. I do 
ideally you'd buy both for both brighter and darker scenarios, but the two to five stop will be the most useful in most situations. Here's an example of shooting on a sunny day at 1 50th of a shutter speed and 2.8 aperture with the two to five stop variable ND. When set to two stops, you can see that it's way too bright, but at five stops, it gives you almost a perfect exposure. You'll just have to bring up your aperture a tad. And if a cloud rolls in front of the sun, you can quickly twist the variable ND down to like a three or a four and get your exposure back to perfect without having to change any camera settings or pop on any new filters. So the two to five stop variable ND is super convenient for shooting in mixed sunny and cloudy environments at a low aperture and at 1 50th of a shutter. And here's now a look at the same sunny day with the six to nine stop variable ND. And at six stops, you can see that it's the perfect exposure, which is equal to an ND64. But when you turn it up to nine stops, it's obviously way too dark. So going down to nine stops is really only going to be useful if you want to shoot long exposure photos to get that smooth water or blurry traffic look. So if you're going to pick up one of these two variable NDs, definitely go with a two to five stop as it covers the range of an ND8, an ND16, and almost all the way to an ND64. So yes, I do recommend getting the two to five stop variable ND instead of three different fixed ND filters. Moving on to our last filter is the PL or CPL filter, which stands for circular polarizer. A polarizer, like an ND, also cuts down the amount of light that enters into the camera, but what it also does is cuts out the sun's reflection, making colors pop more and giving the appearance of increased dynamic range as it softens the highlights from the sun's reflection. An example of when this is really noticeable is when you're filming water and the sun is reflecting off the water surface. By twisting your circular polarizer, you can reduce or enhance the sun's reflection, allowing you to see through that water. Polarizers also deepen the blues in your skies, creating better contrast from the clouds and reduce that white reflective glare on any green plants, really bringing out those colors. And you can see in this example, it even gets rid of the reflection on my face, again, giving the appearance of increased dynamic range. Personally, I love the look of polarizers as I think it gives your image richer colors, but some people don't like it as much, so it just comes down to personal preference. And I've been asked if I ever use polarizers indoors. The answer is not usually, as there's usually not enough light indoors to be able to use them. But if there is enough light, it is great to be able to reduce light reflection. And again, Polar Pro has different polarizer options that let in more or less light depending on the lighting situations. I recommend owning multiple, but like I mentioned earlier, the one that I find most useful for outdoor shooting in sunny daylight situations is the ND16PL. And sadly, no, there aren't any variable polarizers, just fixed polarizers. So that's one drawback to using polarizers instead of a variable ND. One con to the variable ND though is that it gives you a slight green color cast, whereas the polarizers do not. So just pros and cons to each. Now, if you look on Polar Pro's website, you'll see that they have a few different collections of filters you can get for drones. And I just want to quickly explain the differences between those. The Vivid Collection is what I use for my drone because it's the ND polarizer. So it cuts down not only the light, but also cuts out reflections to give you more vivid colors. And then the Shutter Collection is just regular NDs. For those that don't like the polarizer look, it simply just cuts out light so you can bring down your shutter speed. Then the Exposure Collection is a very heavy light blocker meant for long exposure photos, not really meant for video use. And the Gradient collection is just an in-between exposure option for that shutter collection. I wouldn't buy this as it just gives you more options of different stops of light, but the exposure collection should give you enough options. Now, last thing I want to mention is the thread size of the filter. Once you've decided which filter is right for what you shoot, the next step is to choose a thread size. Every lens has a specific thread size or size of the ring around the lens. Make sure to check your lens to see what your thread size is. It's usually going to be 82 millimeter, 77 millimeter, or 67 millimeter, and some some lenses like my 12 millimeter Lyoa or my 20 millimeter Sigma don't have a thread, so you can't screw on any filters. In that case, you'd have to buy a matte box that allows you to slide in and out filters in front of your lens. But most of my lenses are an 82 millimeter thread size, so that's the size of filter I usually buy. And I recommend buying the thread size of your biggest lens because you can always use step up rings to use bigger thread sizes on smaller lenses. So, for example, my 50 millimeter Sigma lens has a 77 millimeter thread size, but by screwing on a step up ring that allows me to use my 82 millimeter filters on any lenses that are smaller than that. So make sure to buy the thread size of your biggest lens and then just pick up some step up rings for any smaller lenses. So there you have it guys. There's a quick look at the three main types of filters, what they do, when you'd use them and which ones I recommend getting. If you only have the budget to buy one filter, I'd probably get a Polar Pro two to five stop variable ND or the ND16 polarizer. Those will probably be the two most useful filters and the ones that I personally use the most. Now a question I get 
get asked is, can I get away without using any filters at all when shooting in bright daylight? Of course you can, it's not ideal, but you basically have two options if you don't have a filter. Number one, bump up your aperture to adjust to the lighting, but then you will lose that shallow depth of field, or bump up your shutter speed to keep that low aperture background blur, but by bumping up your shutter speed, you will lose that cinematic motion blur and have choppier looking footage. Personally, when I have to choose between those two options, I choose to keep the background blur and lose the motion blur, but film purists will tell you that you should never do that, and I constantly get asked why sometimes I allow myself to shoot at higher shutter speeds like 1 500th or 1 1,000th of a second, and here's four reasons why sometimes I do do that. Reason number one, as I mentioned earlier, filters sometimes can change the quality and look of the lens flare and shift color casts. Basically, anytime you put an extra piece of glass in front of your lens, it has the potential to reduce your image quality. Reason number two, sometimes I have clients that ask for steals from the video footage, and I can't pull steals from footage that was shot at 1 50th of a shutter speed. It's just way too blurry, so by shooting at higher shutter speeds, the footage can double as sharp steel photographs as well. Reason number three is if I'm shooting something where there's not a lot of movement, like this sit-down interview right now, where basically the only thing moving is my mouth, then nobody's really going to be able to tell what shutter speed I was shooting at because there's not enough motion to detect the amount of motion blur. In fact, none of you knew it until I'm telling you right now, but I'm not following the double shutter speed rule. I'm shooting at 24 frames per second right now, and I'm shooting at a 1 25th shutter speed. So if you've been watching this video without noticing it, then that's why I think sometimes you can get away with bumping up your shutter speed. And reason number four is when shooting slow motion, you have to bring your shutter speed higher anyway, and I found that when slowing footage down, using even higher shutter speeds than double the frame rate isn't as noticeable. Unless you speed it back up to real time, then you can start to notice that choppy look. So as long as you keep the footage slowed down, higher shutter speeds aren't as noticeable. That having been said, for the best, most natural looking motion blur, I always recommend setting your shutter speed to double your frame rate and using filters to allow you to do that. But if you don't have a filter, those are four reasons why you might be able to justify not following that rule. But there you have it guys, that's it for filters. Links are in the description where to buy each of these filters. And if you have any further questions, please let me know.